Okay, we're live. All right, I will call the general committee meeting to order. Welcome to our virtual general committee meeting this evening. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, physical distancing measures, a general committee is continuing to practice physical distancing and all members of council, executive management, the city clerk are participating via video conference. Senior leadership team who have reports on tonight's agenda are not visible, but are available to answer questions as needed on the reports that are on tonight. Uh, the first item on our agenda, as always, is the consent agenda. I'll read out the motion printed on the agenda, or at least the, the title associated with the recommended motions and the items for discussion. Members of general committee can ask that the item be held. So can be discussed further tonight. If the item's not held, the motion printed on the agenda is deemed to be approved on consent. And we'll go forward to city council for our consideration at our next meeting. Following the consent agenda, we do have one presentation by staff tonight. We'll do that after the consent agenda. Reports of reference advisory or special committees on tonight's agenda. Uh, we have the report of the Finance and Corporate Services Committee from January 12th that's to be received. Finance and Corporate Services has recommended the following motions. First, with regards to the Barry Baycats Baseball Club, Barry Community Sports Complex. The holds, that is approved. Uh, next, regarding a motion regarding the Route 11 service model. That is approved. Uh, the next item is with regards to transit planning principles. No holds there, that is approved. Uh, we have an item regarding an inclusive community grant. That's for the Seniors Without Walls program. That is approved. Uh, finally, we have the fourth quarter internal audit status report, 2020 fraud and wrongdoing program activity summary of 2020 audit activity and the 2021 internal audit work plan. No holds, that is approved. The staff reports tonight. Uh, can somebody hold the first one? It is the uh, I'll hold it. presentation, sure. Deputy Mayor Ward, thank you. Uh, the next one is an investigation regarding additional parking restrictions along Stanley Street in Ward 3. No holds, oh, held by Councillor Kungle. Okay. Thank you. Held. Next item is with regards to municipal street naming for streets in 109-1369 Ontario, Inc. That's the bullet plan of subdivision. No holds on the street names. They are tentatively approved. Uh, the next one is also regarding naming streets in a new subdivision. That's the Barry Lockhart Road GP, Inc. draft plan of subdivision. No holds. That is approved. Uh, the next staff report on the agenda is with regards to infraction fee invoices under our signed bylaw. No holds. That is approved. Finally, we have updates to our winter maintenance policies. No holds on that. That is approved. We have two items for discussion placed by members of council on the agenda tonight. The first was placed by Councillor Reepma. It's re uh, regarding an installation of a three-way stop at Penetanguishene Road and Indian Arrow Road. No holds. That is approved. The second one is uh, put on by Councillor Aylwin, and it is uh, regarding the installation of an all-way stop at Brock Street and Innisville, also to investigate. Seeing no holds, that is approved. Okay, so we have the two items that were held. The first is the subject of a presentation, so we'll go right to that presentation. I'll now ask Tom Reeves, a senior and uh, our senior asset management planning coordinator uh, from CAM to provide a presentation. Uh, this is concerning our stormwater asset management plan. And just before Tom gets started, uh, Andrea Miller, I believe, was going to give us a few words of introduction. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mayor Lehman, for the opportunity just to introduce uh, Tom's presentation. As you know, asset management uh, is a proactive approach uh, that helps the city to make informed decisions uh, about budgeting, but also about um, how to deliver services in a way that minimizes risk, that um, is sustainable and makes the most financial sense. And we're gonna be coming to you a number of times in 2021 because uh, the corporate asset management team is leading a number of projects that are designed to ensure that the city meets its provincial legislative requirements to have asset management plans in place 
for stormwater, for roads, for water and wastewater assets um, by July of 2021. So this is the first time that there's really been a comprehensive update of these uh, asset management plans um, since 2011. So it's a very important and, and a substantial piece of work that uh, Kelly and Tom are, are undertaking. And we think that it's very important for council to understand this work. Um, we, uh, are going to be able to give you uh, updated asset management plans uh, for the core infrastructure and as those are completed in the coming months we're going to be able to have a much clearer picture about the funding gap and that's a su super important topic as as you remember uh, uh, we just finished the budget cycle and uh, the numbers are going to be able to reflect the increased um, investment that is necessary um, and uh, reflect the capital plan that you've just approved and be in a better position to um, turn out some data that um, is going to help those informed decisions so with that i'd like to ask uh, tom to give you your presentation and then Kelly and Tom are certainly available to answer your questions. Mr. Reeve, welcome to General Committee. The floor is yours. Tom, I think you're still on mute. <laughs> no meeting starts without that. So that's, uh, well, it could be part of it. Um, yeah, sorry about that. And um, I'm happy to be here to share with you an update on our uh, asset management planning efforts. Um, in this presentation today, I'll be giving you a refresher on some of the principles of asset management, as well as providing you with some of the findings of the stormwater asset management plan. This presentation and the attached staff report also serve to advance our asset management objectives by keeping us in compliance with Ontario regulations. The city of Barrie owns around $5 billion worth of assets. These assets allow the city to deliver a wide range of services to residents, businesses, and visitors. Without these assets, we can't provide reliable service. For the purpose of today's presentation, we'll be talking about stormwater. At the city, every group and department is doing asset management every day, even if we don't always call it that. When we make decisions about what type of material to use in a culvert, considering the capital cost and lifespan, we're practicing asset management. When our water operations team flushes a fire hydrant to keep it in good condition, we're practicing asset management. And when we schedule routine maintenance on our HVAC systems, we are practicing asset management. The corporate asset management group works with other departments to help implement best management practices and make strategic decisions. So looking at the stormwater asset management plan specifically, the city owns around 1.2 billion in stormwater assets. This includes things you can see like ponds, ditches, and water courses, and things you don't see like storm sewers and oil grid separation chambers. Stormwater assets are required to protect people and property from flooding. They also play a large role in protecting the environment and mitigating some of the negative impacts of urban development. An important factor in how we manage our assets is understanding what condition they're in. One indication of condition is age. The city of Barrie's stormwater assets are new to middle age, which reflects the recent growth in the city and the emergence of stormwater management as standard practice with new development. One of the things this age graph indicates is although we may have a lot of new stormwater infrastructure now, we could be facing a bump in the future as this large group of infrastructure ages together. One of the value of asset management plans is that we can look ahead and plan for this need. This graph shows the conditions of our assets. As you can see, the majority of the city's assets are in fair or better condition. The major exception is stormwater ponds where we have about $100 million worth of assets in poor condition. This is primarily due to lack of understanding and maintenance during the 90s and 2000s. For the past 10 years, the city's been working to address this backlog and maintenance by cleaning and rehabilitating ponds. The other thing to be aware of is a mostly green asset portfolio requires constant upkeep and renewal 
to prevent more assets from becoming red. Assets exist to provide a service. Ultimately, everything the city does should be linked to the service we want to provide. And therefore we establish metrics to assess our service levels. Without functioning assets built to modern standards, the city with functioning assets, the city is able to provide to protect people and property from flooding and to protect the environment from the pollution from stormwater runoff. We need to make sure that we're spending the limited resources in the area of highest need. By looking at the criticality of an asset and its condition, we can understand the risk it presents. And then we can target interventions on the assets most likely to fail, which leads, which could lead to the worst consequence. The more assets we can keep in the bottom left of the lower of this bottom to the left of the graph, the lower our overall risk profile. The more assets we have on the top right of the figure, the more likely we are to fail to meet expectations to protect people from and property from flooding and to mitigate damage to the environment. Putting together our understanding of the assets, the level of service and the projects identified to fix them, we're able to summarize what the financial implications might be. These two graphs show the needs, the historic spending, and the projected spending. The first graph is about renewal of our current infrastructure. And the second is about growth and upgrade projects to the stormwater assets. As you can see, there's a large difference between what we've historically been spending in the faded columns on the left and what the identified need is represented by the dashed red lines. The proposed spending goes some distance to close this gap, but not all the way, which results in an infrastructure gap here represented by the difference between the red dashed lines and the solid black lines. The third graph is for the operation maintenance of stormwater assets. The amount of stormwater assets the city owns increases with growth. The resource required to maintain them will, will grow as well. As well, there's a step up shown in future near years to allow for a pond cleanout backlog, which was mentioned earlier to be addressed. The final graph shows all the previous glass combined together. This is the total cost of providing stormwater service. As you can see, if we continue historic spending levels, we would be underfunding by about $30 million per year. This is the difference between the black dashed line and the red dashed line. Considering our capital plan includes emphasis on stormwater, there's still an overall gap identified. However, it's been reduced to around $11.7 million. If revenues don't materialize or if stormwater projects are delayed in favor of other needs, this gap could increase. In 2021, the finance team is leading the second phase of the Stormwater Climate Action Fund, which is the next step in creating a dedicated fund for stormwater assets. This will develop a preferred approach for delivering the fund and report back to council. Asset management is an evolving process. As we continue to refine how we best analyze our assets, we gain better financial picture of what is needed and when. We're gonna use this to inform the preparation of future capital and operating budgets. In closing, this stormwater asset management plan has shown us that we've historically been underfunding our stormwater assets. Even with our new focus on stormwater projects, we are falling short of a required funding level. This means we're potentially putting people and property at risk of flooding, causing damage to the environment. We're also putting a financial burden onto future generations. Thank you very much for your attention. And I, as well as others who worked on the team, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Tom, for the presentation. <clears throat> questions, Councillor Morales. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman, uh, to Mr. Reeve. Uh, the city of Barrie is always applying for grants and funding from other levels of government. Do you anticipate, I know it's hard to put in a model because these programs are non-existent or em emerging, but uh, do you anticipate uh, substantial money that we might qualify for, uh, for water infrastructure as it relates to climate mitigation and things of that nature? Because I see that as a big opportunity uh, if we can tap into funding like that. And that might mean you might have to come back to us and speed up a project that was four years out because the funding is here. I'm wondering how, if you, if that might affect our trajectory. I'll probably ask, um, I think Kelly was gonna jump in with some of the questions there generally on the, on the program. Ms. Oakley. 
Sure, through you, Mary Lehman, to Councillor Morales. Um, the city has already been successful in receiving some grants for um, climate adaptation or resilience projects for some storm infrastructure um, uh, through various federal and provincial programs. The National Disaster Mitigation Program, in fact, has provided, um, I think, $3 million for stormwater uh, work at Kids Creek and Dunlop. Uh, and then we've received a number of other grants or and certainly we'll be applying for them. Uh, perfect. And you, you don't need any council direction to basically, we, I, know, I know most departments always have the mandate. If there's money out there, apply for it and try to get it. But you wouldn't need any mandate to um, be ambitious with any funding. Because I, I know from a staff perspective, you know, you know, you guys have your plan and your marching orders and there might be some funding out there, but there might be maybe internal discomfort that if, you were to qualify for that, that now means things have to be shifted around. Would you require council direction to basically apply as much as you can for fundings, even if it disrupts current capital timelines or, or not? Uh, through you, uh, Mayor Lima to Councillor Morales, the, the business plan motion includes um, authority for staff to apply for grants that are for projects that are already in the capital plan. And I think staff would monitor any grants that are available. And if we felt that there were programs that we could um, apply to and advance projects for, then uh, we would certainly uh, come to council with that request as required. Some grant programs require that council endorse the project. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, then we're tired, tied to those requirements, but certainly wherever we can, if we feel we're eligible and we're able to advance a project, then, um, then we would do that respecting the rules of the, of the program. Okay, perfect. As I've always said, Barry residents, that's already monies that they've paid in taxes to other levels of government. So it's always nice to bring that money home. So thanks, Mary Lehman. Thanks, Councilor Morales. Councilor Thompson. Thanks through you, Mary Lehman, to staff. Um, with the budget we just passed you know, with some of the intake forms, can you maybe just give us some clarification on how that would help with some of the gapping Uh, sure, through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Thompson. There were a couple of intake forms in the operating budget in Mr. Friary's area that um, I believe reinstated uh, historical levels of funding for a pond cleanout, as well as ensured that there would be human resources in place to complete that work. Um, and so certainly that helps to address the gap on the operating side. Um, and then there are a number of capital projects in the in the city's capital plan to um, complete stormwater pond retrofits or increase culvert sizes uh, and other things that will help address our stormwater needs. Perfect, thank you. Councillor Thompson, Councillor Congle. Thank you, Worship. Through you to Mr. Reeve or Ms. Oakley. Um, I've had the benefit of getting to know some of the members of uh, the staff around some of the, the pond uh, management and uh, stormwater management in Ward 3. And do get a couple of questions with respects to um, outside of some of the, the more formal pond cleanup uh, aspects, um, the ongoing maintenance. And I was wondering if either of you could help for those watching tonight to identify other than the major, um, the cleanup uh, aspects, um, is there routine uh, kind of checks on pond um, on pond status and in general, is there a role um, residents can play? I have um, several residents in the ward who are, um, I would call them ambassadors around pond health. Uh, and as we get into the spring, uh, questions from last year that I'm anticipating, um, often we see a lot of plastic and garbage through the train uh, link fencing and requests around spring cleanups or access to that. I was wondering if you could also identify what the general maintenance around the pond areas uh, is for staff and, and how you would like to see some of those uh, requests for service come into to either service Barry or through to the team. 
Uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Kungle, I will take a shot at this, and then certainly if Mr. Fryer is on the line, he may want to step in. Um, I know that his team does uh, regular annual inspections of the ponds, looking at pond condition um, and some of the key components of the pond to ensure that they're functioning the way that they're intended to function. Um, and I would suspect he would be looking for any requests for service to come in through Service Barry. Um, but uh, but uh, Dave or Andrea, if you would like to chime in, feel free. Your Worship and members of the committee, uh, thank you for the question. And absolutely, we uh, like to see the requests come in through Service Barry. Uh, I can tell you that uh, we have a, a staff of four or five people that uh, continually monitor the ponds. Um, every year, we, we check sediment depth and even the, um, you know, what the sediment is as well. So uh, we keep an eye on, on the ponds if the uh, members of the general public uh, would like to assist. Um, absolutely keep an eye on the pond if they see it, you know, the, the water levels uh, getting too high. Um, from time to time, the, uh, the outlets will get plugged, uh, could be from sediment, trees, beavers, all those things. So um, please let us know and uh, we'll send folks out. We try and get out to the ponds uh, at least once a year for, uh, for cleanup. So um, it, it's a regularly scheduled thing, but if they would uh, like to, um, you know, give us a shout, uh, absolutely. Uh, we would like uh, any assistance they can give. I would hesitate from having them going into pond areas that are fenced. Um, they're fenced for a reason. They're fenced because the slopes are, are a little dangerous and, uh, you know, we don't want uh, any children or, or people, um, you know, working around the ponds in an unsafe manner. So I hope that answers your question. That does. Thank you, Mr. Friary. And I think uh, that'll be helpful uh, as we start looking at, uh, neighborhood cleanups and surrounding areas. And uh, my compliments again to the team. They've been incredibly responsive over the, the past year uh, on a particular pond where there's been some concerns with drainage and and, uh, and issues with some fallen trees. So um, I know it's uh, uh, a lot of work covering all those assets across the city and I do appreciate um, the team you've got. Thanks, Councillor Congo. Councillor Natalie Harris. Thank you, Mary Lehman. Uh, through you, um, I'm probably to Ms. Miller, uh, I know that we had some good conversations around the Bear Creek Pond uh, that did have the, the fence and the kind of protection around it because we were doing some cleanup. I think it would be maybe uh, inf information the public can hear uh, that's helpful. What does staff do to um, maintain the safety of the turtles when they're migrating? That was kind of the issue we had was sometimes they're blocked with the fences. So if you could just share what we do when we have to clean the ponds, that's obviously part of the maintenance, but what we do as a city to protect those species. Through you, Mayor Lehman, to, uh, to Councillor uh, Natalie Harris. I'll let Mr. Friary um, give you the details on that because uh, it is something that his team takes care of. Your Worship and members of committee, um, one of the things that happens on, on any of these projects is, is we enlist a biologist who comes in and he, he does a, a little bit of an inventory of any animals, any endangered species that may in, be in those ponds. That is unfortunately also one of our biggest challenges with cleaning out those ponds. Uh, the last thing we want to do is, is disrupt uh, any of the wildlife, you know, mating habits, habitat, anything like that. So, you know, typically most of the ponds will be cleaned out in September when, uh, you know, when the, the, the young animals have, have sort of flown away and, and left the area. But, um, you know, anytime folks see, uh, you know, turtles or anything like that around the pond, um, you know, just give us a shout. We'll do our best to uh, to make sure that they're removed safely. Um, you know, what I'd like to remind people as well is that these ponds um, are actually tools. They're a piece of infrastructure. They're not necessarily wildlife habitat. The water that is running in them is coming off of your driveway, off the roadways, and it's not ideal for wildlife. So, you know, just like to remind people that I, you know, certainly don't put any of your goldfish or anything like that into the pond. Um, we would appreciate that as well. Thanks. Through you, may, may I just follow up, Mayor Lydia? Go ahead. That's excellent information. I've never even heard of that before. Um, my goldfish go into a different route 
when need be. Um, so I just, sorry, I just, yeah, I wanted to thank you because we did have some issues with the turtles and it was kind of a delay in removing the, um, the fencing. So I, I do know that you responded really quickly and we were able to address it, which was really great and helpful. So um, for people watching, if you have any concerns, reach out to your counselor, but we are always watching that this is taken care of properly. So thanks. I know we all just wanted Marlon to find Nemo, but this isn't the way to do it. Uh, Councillor Gary Harvey, you're up next. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, question to staff. Uh, one of the key components that I took out of this presentation was the uh, the funding gap piece. And uh, just kind of curious, obviously, I'm sure every municipality suffers the same uh, strain when it comes to funding gaps, but how, how do we fall in play uh, when we compare mm. ourselves to uh, other municipalities of a similar size? Uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Harvey. Uh, so um, we'll probably have to report back with information on uh, stormwater gap uh, across the province a little bit later um, because, count, because municipalities aren't required to have their asset management plans in place until July. Many haven't, and they're sort of racing against the clock to do it. Um, certainly, we know that um, from um, this, the, there's a national report card on infrastructure that does report um, on the gap that we're we're in good company. There are lots of places that have significant gaps. Um, I don't. I, I sorry. I can't quote the the um, gaps of some of our closest competitors. Or sorry, I didn't mean competitors. Comparators. Um, we're unique in Barrie in terms of our stormwater needs uh, because of the lake and the number of creeks we have. So it's it's a really tough thing to compare. Um, but certainly, we'd be happy to report back to you when we when we see what other folks are are sharing um, closer to the milestone in July. Great, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Harvey. Uh, Councillor Aylwin, did I see you indicate? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Reeve. Thanks so much for the presentation. I noticed uh, close to the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned uh, natural assets. Uh, and I'm wondering if we have ever done a natural asset inventory to sort of take stock of our water courses, forests, wetlands, um, and see what we have and how we can manage them? Um, and if not, do we have any plans to do so in the future? Uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, to the members of the committee. The, um, so the short answer is yes, we are um, looking to try to include natural assets in our asset portfolio. Stormwater being the first asset management plan to include, we've included water courses for the first time because as, a, as an asset that provides a drainage service as among, a, among many other services to the environment and subsequent asset management plans. When we look, start looking at parks or facilities, we can start to look at some of the, the other natural assets that we have across the city. So it's certainly something that um, industry best practice is leading towards doing. We haven't, some municipalities have approached it as we'll do a separate asset management plan for natural assets. So far, we've started to include it in the, in the kind of the other core assets that they fit in, in with the city assets. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Councillor Owen. Councillor Reefma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, just following up with Mr. Reeve, um, uh, there's a lot, a lot of areas in our city that don't have stormwater management. Uh, they were built long before stormwater management became uh, known to us. Um, and I'm just wondering, do your numbers include anything that would um, retrofit or create new storm facilities in uh, the existing built up areas. Through you, Mayor Lehman, to, uh, to Council Ritma. So yes, it does. It is included in the stormwater asset management plan. Um, all the projects that were identified in the 2019 drainage master plan, which includes retrofits of some dry ponds to wet ponds to provide water quality and also includes inclu in introducing new stormwater management infrastructure into areas that historically developed without it. Those have all been included in the needs and upgrade numbers um, so that we're trying to capture that, that sort of catch up we need to do because of the air historic areas that don't have stormwater management. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Ritma. Uh, any further questions on the presentation? I just had one, uh, I guess, to close it out. Um, you know, when I was reading the uh, management plan, it, 
you know, somewhere in there early on, it reminded me of the population forecasts for Barry. And, uh, you know, we've got uh, over the next 30 years, almost a doubling in our forecast population, which presumably means we're going to build as much stormwater infrastructure over the next uh, uh, 30 years as exists to this in, in the city to date or something close to it. Um, is there, uh, can we bend this curve, this very expensive cost curve um, by using low impact development? Uh, is there any way to do things like uh, end of driveway rain infiltration, uh, all those sorts of uh, design techniques that are now uh, being experimented with in subdivision design and lot design uh, in the annex lands. Um, I know there was uh, quite a bit of work that was attempted on low impact design through stormwater ponds, but we still ended up with a lot of swim ponds in the new neighborhoods. Are there other measures though that if the city um, required them to be adopted in the plans of subdivision as the city builds out, uh, will actually reduce the amount of stormwater that we have to, the very expensive <laughs> cost for upgrading culvert sizes and um, uh, all the work that has to go on downstream when the flows uh, increase with growth. So uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Mary Lou. It's um, a really good point. The, so the, the, the asset management plan does actually look at what's projected to come online through the secondary plan areas. It isn't quite doubling Barry because of the, the density is much, uh, is much greater than some of the existing Barry. So we're not covering the same area, but it's very significant. And low impact development and measures on site can be a way to, um, well, it's, it's the more modern techniques for managing stormwater and it ha does have benefits to the environment and, and protection of infrastructure. The one of the things that's probably favoring Barry related to that is that a lot of that stuff is on private lots. So um, it's providing a service, but it's also not necessarily becoming uh, city owned and therefore assets we have to uh, renew and, and maintain. Um, ultimately, Stormwater management, as it's practiced today, um, you know, is a pretty significant, uh, you know, brings brings us some some significant assets that require, um, particularly ponds, which are always going to be part of stormwater management, or at least a currently envisioned part of stormwater management. Um, we do have a, a around twenty ponds that are becoming on the secondary plan area that we're going to have to to manage and maintain. Yeah. So I guess my my specific question and follow up to that is. It struck me when we went through the secondary planning process that we started that process with the intention of fairly aggressively adopting those measures. But my sense is that when the plans of subdivision came out the other end, they were more traditional stormwater management plans uh, that were incorporated into those plans of subdivision. Um, and my knowledge on this is not great, so I'm looking for an answer from from staff. You know, if if we had done things like requiring at the bottom of every driveway, uh, a, a grate with a French drain that keeps the water from going onto the street, but rather infiltrates it into the soil on the property itself. Are, uh, did we require those kinds of, I mean, that's an extreme example. I know we didn't do that, <laughs> but did we do those sorts of things? Um, and is there capacity for us to do more of that now that we are aware of not just the capital cost of building all this infrastructure, but obviously the very significant cost of managing all this infrastructure? So, so to your specific question, um, LIDs and low impact development and the measures are being required in the secondary plan area. And that is giving us in a lot of ways, a higher level of service than the existing stormwater infrastructure, traditional stormwater infrastructure has greater water quality, greater water balance, which helps protect the environment. Um, ultimately though, the stormwater Ponds are, are required for quantity and flood control, which um, the science is limited that you can't provide those kinds of services on site and low impact developments have a small impact on, on kind of rare, rare 50 year events and those kinds of things. And uh, also regardless of how we get the material, the stormwater managed on site, which is the optimal on lot is the best, is the best and cheapest long, long way to manage stormwater. We still have to deal with drainage from our roadways and conveyance of those major events, which requires pipes and ponds. So we are trying, I think through low impact development does, does help, but uh, also we, um, requiring modern, modern stormwater infrastructure, um, you know, it does cost more than, than the traditional let it drain away and let the creeks worry about it approach, which is of course what's caused a lot of environmental damage in some areas. 
Okay, thanks for that. And I mean, fair enough. The, and and that point you just made, I think, is a key piece. Uh, you know, there's cities in California where it rains like three days all year, but they've still got huge stormwater management systems and floodways because the consequence of those three days a year not having a system to to deal with the water is devastating. And uh, even though we it rains a lot more than that here. I guess we still have to build for those major events, and and those events are increasing with uh, with climate change. Um, but um, thank you uh, for this. Thank you for the presentation. Um, we do have the report coming up first uh, at uh, uh, in general committee's agenda. So if there are no other questions, we'll just move into that. Members of committee, uh, that was uh, the first item that was held. Deputy Mayor Ward, you want to put it on the floor? I will put it on the floor. I do have a comment and question, though. Go ahead. Uh, my comment, first of all, I was thinking when I was reading this report as how in all my years on council, and there's been many of them, I have been to uh, celebrations or openings of all kinds of city infrastructure. I've been to bridges, to uh, subdivisions, to rec centers, to soccer pitches. Um, Our first fire electricity halls, plant. Just, just about everything. And I've never been to a single function involving stormwater management. I mean, it's kind of says something about how underappreciated it is, which is really unfortunate because it's pretty clear it's one of the most important services we offer as a city, both in terms of preventing flooding and uh, and keeping the water in uh, both Little Lake and Kempfield Bay cleaner. And so I think it's it's too bad that we don't pay more attention to our stormwater management pond. I think our staff is paying attention to it, but I think as a city or people, we don't really pay a lot of attention to it. Now, my question is, um, I take it from reading the report, we've, right now we've got about a 50-50 split between dry, what are called dry ponds and wet ponds. And maybe I can ask staff to maybe ex give me a, a line or two explaining what the difference is. And uh, am, I, am I right in that we're switching, trying to go over to more wet ponds and away from dry ponds? True, you may lean to Deputy Mayor Ward. Um, yes, so dry, uh, just to give you a little hit, so we do have probably about a few more dry ponds than we have wet ponds. Um, and a little bit that's due to the history of development. Originally, stormwater management ponds were focused prim primarily on the flood protection. So it was just being used in extreme events to hold back flows to protect downstream lands from flooding and erosion. And subsequently, as the science evolved through the 90s, um, primarily we started to introduce wet ponds, which provide a water quality function by having a uh, a pool of water there allows sedimент to fall out and a lot of the contaminants are, are contained within the sediment. And the, the, the sort of the third step in that, which uh, Mayor Lehman referred to earlier, is, is now um, wet ponds are still part of a, a progressive solution, but also including more infiltration and low impact development to get the water into the ground. And hopefully those, and, and you saw probably one of my slides had um, uh, indicators of where we are in terms of uh, wet ponds versus dry ponds and where we're trying to go with them. Um, Trying to get to more wet ponds ultimately gets our, our water quality objectives, um, um, you know, getting closer to, to protecting the lake, as you say, Lake Simcoe and, and Little Lake and, and the Nottawasaga River ultimately for, uh, for, part of, for part of Barrie and getting that, the water clean running off of our urban development. Okay, thanks. And that explains one of the, the my next question is I, I noticed there's about a $15,000 or $16,000 difference between the annual maintenance costs of a dry pond versus a wet. The dry ponds are, I think, were 41000 a year, it works out to, and the wet ponds works out to um, 57000 I think. So that is why, even though they're more expensive, we're going towards wet ponds? Um, through your email, even to Deputy Mayor Ward, co yeah, correct. They're providing a higher level of service, and they, they do um, require more maintenance um, as a, than, than dry ponds. In terms of the uh, the area they cover, in terms of they're getting the inflow from, are they about the same, or do one of them serve a larger area? Um, through you, Mayor Lehman, to, to Deputy Mayor Ward, the the areas uh, depend really on the on what, how the development was was built originally. So, um, typically, dry ponds would service a smaller area, but a dry pond can service a really large area, and and wet ponds can serve really small areas. I would say that just knowing the city stormwater ponds, the, the wet ponds tend to be the larger ponds um, because of the ones that are have sort of been built more recently with um, and you know it's kind of more um, in the greenfield areas. So they they tend to have larger service areas, but it, it does vary quite a lot. And ponds are really each pond is really quite unique in the city. Okay, thank you. That's it. Thanks, Deputy Mayor Ward. Uh, others wish to comment? 
Okay. Um, the only other question I had was um, actually in in relation to how to pay for this, because if council endorses the plan, of course, the, the infrastructure gap that's here is quite obvious and, and significant. Um, the uh, climate action, <laughs> I take your point, Deputy Mayor Ward. I think if we called them, uh, you know, lake protection facilities or clean water, uh, clean swimming facilities, whatever you want to call them, uh, probably we would cut ribbons on more of them than if we call them stormwater management ponds. But I, that is what they do. And I think we want to do more of it, uh, but we're limited by funding. The climate action um, fund that uh, staff are working on, uh, can I get an update on the work that's um, uh, being done there? Uh, to you, Mayor Lehman, members of the General Committee. So finance is uh, being tasked to take over, over that role. So we're, we're actually in the process of this week of just uh, signing the contract and getting uh, ACON on board with us. Um, we have a plan to bring back, um, to report back to Council with the full, um, what the program would completely look like, including potential rebate opportunities. The goal is to have a plan before Council at the end of this year or early January of next year. We will be having uh, numerous uh, public information sessions um, throughout the year as well, looking to engage uh, members of the community as well as coming to council to uh, to explain the process. So we're well on our way and uh, should have lots of good conversations to come. All right, thank you for that. Uh, with that, uh, I will ask if there's any other comments or questions on this one. Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor of the motion, it's on the floor. Any opposed? None, that carries. Uh, the only other item that was held was held by Councillor Kungel. Uh, you held the parking restrictions along Stanley Street. Go ahead, Councillor Kungel. Yes, um, thank you, Your Worship. Through you to staff, I've got two questions, um, but I did want to point out that this motion does have a, a actually a quite informative staff memo in the circulation list. And I wanted to point to that on a couple of notes. Uh, to start off, uh, one comment, uh, my thanks to staff that did an investigation um, that led from several meetings with residents that observed accidents uh, on that route and some blind spots. Um, from there though, um, a lot of other innovative opportunities came to the table through Mr. Rose and other staff members. I did wanna point out that within that staff memo, there was an indication that talked about the application of a painted median as a traffic calming initiative uh, that actually has shown positive uh, outcomes around reducing, reducing speeding and, and having some good impacts around uh, calming. And that was placed um, because of some positive, I think work, I believe it might've been in Ward 2, uh, Councillor Aylwin, if I'm correct, but there was, uh, it was initiated as a pilot uh, in the city um, as an opportunity. So that's actually been painted just before the back entrance to the mall off of Stanley Street, just north of Livingston. So I did wanna thank staff for some of those uh, additional measures that we're seeing some good impact with in case it comes up as a topic of interest uh, coming into spring and coming out of a budget where traffic calming was definitely a topic of interest uh, in addition to some of those uh, speed, uh, um, speed cushions and, uh, and whatnot. Um, my questions to staff though, um, relate to several resident conversations around the no parking restrictions that uh, have been added. Um, these are not isolated to Stanley Street, but they do, um, with this change, do uh, raise the same questions. One is, um, when we've got a Canada Post um, mailbox uh, unit in proximity of an area where we've got no parking and no parking signage going up, um, could staff um, um, identify uh, for members of the public how bylaw would look at that from an enforcement perspective. I'm getting some questions in general at, at different areas where we see close proximity of no parking signs to Canada Post mailboxes, uh, and I'm hoping to mitigate the need for requests to change signage. It's my current understanding that individuals who are stopping for a period of time to grab their mail um, in general will, will not be ticketed for doing so. And maybe that's then through you, um, your worship to perhaps Ms. Miller. Ms. Miller or Ms. Cook on uh, enforcement? Yeah, Ms. Cook. Ms. Cook. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mary Lehman. Um, before I answer the question, can we have uh, Councillor Kungo put the item on the floor? 
Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> my fault too. <laughs> That's good. Um, uh, sorry, my views changed. Um, I'm putting the item on the floor as written in the agenda. Okay, go ahead uh, and the question, Ms. Cook. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Hi, um, through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Kungal. Um, no, we would not uh, ticket somebody when they're stopping for, for their mail. Um, as long as they don't park there for hours at a time, um, people are allowed to stop and get their mail. Thank you. Um, I believe that, um, I believe that's everything on that end around um, the mail, uh, the mailbox um, from a bylaw. Sorry, I think uh, another question of mine was, has been answered by email, so I'll leave it there. Okay, uh, items on the floor is printed. Any other questions, comments on this matter? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor of the motion. Are any opposed? None, that carries. Thank you, uh, I believe that completes. Uh, the items that have been held tonight, and it already brings us to inquiries. Deputy Mayor Ward, any inquiries I, of staff? I have none. Members of general committee, any inquiries of staff? Seeing none, announcements, Deputy Mayor Ward. I have none. I see a few members of council who do. Uh, Councillor Morales, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, start with a lighthearted announcement as I, I try to pull up the poster here. Uh, I got an extension cord. So anybody, uh, all members of council who were patient with me the other the other week, we will not have a 11th and a half point nine hour drop off. Uh, so that is going to be uh, reliable moving forward. I also wanted to make an announcement uh, by a teacher, the English chairperson um, of uh, St. Peter's High School uh, in Ward 9, uh, Ms. Heron reached out to me about promoting this event, Diverse Voices Unite. Um, she has been uh, the organizer on this event, um, as well as the video producer being my former Eng uh, grade 12 English teacher, uh, Ms. Oliver. Uh, the event is called Diverse Voices Unite, and it's honoring and celebrating Black History Month. Uh, this year, it's going to be on February 15th on YouTube, the release at 10 a.m. And then on Rogers, there's going to be a live event February 24th at 6 p.m. We're going to have some uh, well-known local names, uh, such as Kevin Frankish um, and uh, Harry Hughes, Mayor of Orvidante. Uh, uh, we're also going to have uh, Sama Othman, um, Communications Officer with the OPP, as well as other uh, artists uh, and historians um, and basketball coaches as it relates to uh, Black youth as well. Um, so once again, this is... Um, uh, to promote Black History Month and listen to various stories of the Black community. So once again, that's going to be on YouTube video release February 15th at 10 a.m. Rogers live event February 24th uh, at 6 p.m. And it's going to be um, on a, um, uh, the, the YouTube channel it's going to be released on is going to be PD Panther uh, YouTube channel. I will post it on my social media um, and I know other members of council um, have been, have either gotten this information or will be getting it soon as well and that's it great uh thank you councillor morales councillor Elwin. thank you mayor lehman uh, i do have an announcement here <clears throat> sorry uh so uh, i'd like to draw the public's attention to a virtual event that will be happening monday february 15th in the evening and it is uh, a vigil to honor the lives that we've lost to the toxic drug crisis here in Barrie. Um, so I'll read a little piece from the event here. So join us as we come together as a community to mourn our friends, partners, children, and neighbors lost to this ongoing toxic drug crisis. While we can't physically be together, we can light a candle and virtually share pictures, tears, smiles, laughter, grief, warm memories, and our collective need for something to change. And uh, people can find the details uh, on my website, keenan.ca. There's a link on the front page to the Facebook event page. Uh, and that's a vigil to honor the lives lost to the toxic drug supply crisis. And that's February 15th. It's a Monday uh, from 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. And that's virtual. Um, today, as uh, Councillor Morales 
mentioned uh, is the beginning of Black History Month. And I'd just like to make the public aware that there are two great organizations in the community um, that are doing important work on this. Uh, Uplift Black and Making Change Across Simcoe County will have uh, some programming virtually over the course of the month. So I would encourage people to uh, to check out those two organizations. Uh, so that's upliftblack.org and makingchangesc.com. Upliftblack.org and makingchangesc.com for some Black History Month programming. Thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Owen, for that as well. And Councillor Morales, uh, you saved me uh, uh, an announcement there too, which is great. Uh, Councillor Jim Harris. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. I'd like to make an announcement uh, to remind folks that there is a um, public consultation neighborhood meeting scheduled for Wednesday, uh, February 3rd, and it's regarding a proposed development for 520 and 526 Big Bay Point Road. You can get the uh, details for uh, registering for the virtual uh, meeting uh, at the uh, City of Barrie website under Ward 8 Developments. Thank you. There we go. I was muted. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Harris. Uh, any other announcements, uh, members of General Committee? Okay, I have a few. Uh, as has been noted a couple of times already, um, we have actually proclaimed the month of uh, February as Black History Month in the city of Barrie, and I, would, uh, I won't repeat some of the notes I've got here, but I certainly encourage people to um, uh, search out the virtual events that will be happening this year uh, in replace, uh, uh, replacement of some of the um, events that we've had at the Five Points Theatre and Georgian Theatre and through, uh, through other platforms in the past. Uh, they, they do all have to be online this year, but there are a number of really great events going on uh, and uh, several that are being organized by teachers in our public school system as well. Um, we have also proclaimed uh, February 2nd tomorrow, Groundhog Day, as T Tuesday, uh, and that is in support of uh, charities that um, uh, help um, in the fight against homelessness. And February 6th is International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation in the City of Barrie. Uh, the City is partnering with the Simcoe Muskoka Health Unit and Urban Pantry to explore three new locations for community gardens, Riverwood Park, Lampman Lane Park, and Bateau. Uh, park residents can provide their feedback by completing the survey that's online uh, and attending the virtual public information center meetings. The Riverwood Park uh, a meeting was already held last week on the 28th. Lampman Lane is the 10th at 5 p.m. and Bateau Park is the 11th at 5 p.m. For more information and uh, to register for those meetings and complete the survey, it's barry.ca slash community gardens. Effective January 1st, 2021, there have been some changes made to parking passes. Uh, please do check out the city's website, barrier.ca slash parking, if you own a parking pass, just to make sure none of those changes affect your regular pattern. If you are still coming to uh, anywhere in the downtown to park or anywhere in the city where there is paid parking. Uh, and of course, uh, a reminder that across the city, the overnight parking restrictions are in effect through February and March to allow for snow plowing, no parking from midnight till 7 a.m. on street. Uh, the Ontario government extended the state of emergency and the orders associated with it, of course, including the stay at home order. Uh, the 14 days um, will expire on February 9th. So February 10th would be the day that either the order ceases and a new uh, form of uh, restrictions hopefully lighter will go into effect or it will be continued and that will depend of course on the path of the pandemic from here. Uh, we also heard today the education minister indicate that on Wednesday they will announce a timeline for the reopening of schools. Uh, I do have to reiterate though the provincial stay-at-home order requires everybody to remain at home and only leave for essential purposes, going to the grocery store or pharmacy, accessing health care for exercise or for uh, if you are an essential worker, of course. Uh, if you have questions about what's open, uh, call the Stop the Spread Business Information line. Uh, that's 888-444-3659. And of course, up-to-date information is available at barry.ca slash services about our services and on the health unit's website about uh, virtually everything to do with the pandemic. Uh, you will have seen and hopefully heard by now 
um, some stronger messaging that we've uh, put out in the last week uh, around the importance of staying home. And uh, for those watching tonight, I just want to reiterate uh, the reason this is so critical right now is the potential presence of the more contagious variant uh, in our community of COVID-19 uh, that went through uh, Roberta Place. Uh, and um, it is uh, very much up to us over this week, last week, this week, and next week uh, to stop or slow the spread of that variant. It will make an enormous difference as we are now literally in a race against uh, vaccinations between uh, the variant and vaccinations. Uh, and if we are successful as a community in slowing the spread of the variant, uh, the chances of us being able to um, open up sooner uh, and far more importantly, the number of lives that will be saved will be that much greater. So thank you for everybody who is doing their part and uh, for everybody who's helping spread the message. This is tough. It's like being right at the end of a marathon and you've got the finish line in sight and now you have to sprint. And that's the last thing you feel like you've got the energy to do. Um, but it is what we do at the end of a race. And I think the next couple of months are the end of the race. So we need to do this. And uh, again, I can only say thank you to everybody who is helping spread the word and, and um, saving lives by staying home. Uh, circulation lists, members of council. Um, January 25th, anything from the January 25th circulation list? Okay, I'm seeing none. February 1st, 2021. Tonight's. Okay, seeing none, that completes general committee. General committee is adjourned at 7.57. We will see you all tomorrow night for city building and planning committee.